All right, I'd like you, if you would, turn with me in your Bibles once again to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, We're going to begin just by reading our key verses, and then I want to read a passage in the Old Testament as well that's going to have a bearing on our thinking in this session. And so 1 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse uh, 14, it says, uh, the Apostle Paul speaking uh, to his friend Timothy, "'These things write I unto thee,' hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. And then please, if you would turn with me to the book of Genesis, and you might uh, keep a ribbon or something in Genesis chapter 28, because uh, we're going to be going back and forth a little bit between uh, these two chapters. But Genesis 28, I'm going to begin reading in verse 10, and I'm going to read till the end of the chapter. And, of course, uh, we were told last night, give attention to reading, so we're going to make sure we do that, right? The importance of reading the Word of God. One thing for sure, if anything else you hear may, may or may not be true, but this is true, what you're going to hear right now. <clears throat> it says in verse 10, And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran, and he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night, because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father and the God of Isaac, The land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth. And thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee, and in thy seed, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place? This is none other than uh, but the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of that city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, I will give me uh, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone, which I have set for a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. And again, God will bless that reading from his precious word to us uh, this morning. So we began yesterday, and it's good to just a little review, just very brief, and that is we we talked about how essential the house of God is, even though sometimes our governments don't think so, it really is essential. It's essential because it's perhaps the only place in our our culture where you're going to hear the truth. Uh, Because sadly, uh, the lies of the evil one, the propaganda mechanism, of the chief minister of evil and propaganda is going out rapidly throughout the world. And we said that the house of God, as well as being a place where you're going to get the truth, is a place where it's a witness to divine order in the midst of satanic disorder. I think that's a very important statement, a witness to divine order in the midst of satanic disorder. 
And so the importance of the house of God. And we just began last night with a brief overview of First Timothy. And if you remember, we, all we did was we looked at the repeated words and phrases. And we, we saw particularly three words that are emphasized over and over again. And when we put them together, we got a big picture. We got the big picture view. And we saw that faith is mentioned numerous times in First Timothy, but always negatively. It's always erring from the faith, departing from the faith, uh, having left their first faith. And, and it's, so it's this negative idea of departure. And so already, Paul said in the latter days, uh, some shall depart from the faith. And we, we already saw that that was happening in his day. How much more so today? It's a day of departure. People abandoning the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. The faith uh, that is really essential in our world. People are bailing out they're leaving the faith. And then, so how, what's the solution? Well, he talks about sound doctrine, healthy doctrine, health-giving, hygienic doctrine. And there was a great emphasis on the importance of doctrine. Uh, you warn people, Timothy, they teach no other doctrine, right? And just a great emphasis on doctrine. And we saw it over and over and over again. And we saw the value of it, the, the importance of sound teaching. And then the final word was doctrine which is according to godliness. In other words, if this doctrine is the right doctrine, it will have the right impact on people's lives. It will produce godliness in them. And so it will have a beautiful impact on those that hear it. It will transform them. It will change them and make them less like themselves and more like God, right? And it will, it's a transforming message that makes us more like the Lord Jesus every single day. And so praise the Lord for that. And so that was the big picture. Now we want to think a little bit more about the, the key verse. Thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth, verse 15. Now, I want to think about that verse because I want to just try and get into the mind of the apostle. What was he thinking when he, he said, uh, this is really important, Timothy, that you know how you ought to behave in the house of God because he's there correcting error, teaching truth, preaching doctrine. Why is it important, this idea of behaving in the house of God? Several things that I want to just say, just by way of introduction. What's involved in Paul's mind? Remember, Timothy has been left in Ephesus. And in Ephesus, there was a, a temple there that was reputed to be a house of God. It was actually a, a, a female deity that was worshipped. Remember, great is Diana of the Ephesians. And, and so the, the very background, at least, that Timothy is operating in is overshadowed by this, this temple that is called the house of God as far as they're concerned, but it's a false god. And it's not even a living God. Remember, he says, the house of God, which is the church of the living God. And actually, Diana was a meteorite that fell down from heaven that just happened to look like a many-breasted woman. So they said, this is Diana. She is, you know, kind of the fertility goddess, uh, hence all the breasts and that, the idea. And so basically, they worshipped a rock. Not the rock, right? God is our rock, but they worshipped a, a meteorite that fell from heaven. And it was dead. It was inanimate. It, it couldn't hear. It, it couldn't do anything. I mean, if it had to move somewhere, it, people had to carry it. And, and just the folly of it. And so this is the, the background. There's a background to this epistle. Timothy is there, and he's telling people how they should behave in the house of God which is the pillar and ground of the truth, and it's the house which is the church of the living God. By the way, aren't you thankful this morning that our God is alive? He's not dead. He's living. It's a living God and a living Savior. And everything about it, this house is life, not death. Even the stones that this house is made up of, according to 1 Peter, are living stones built up a spiritual house, right? So everything about it is alive. Everything about the one in Ephesus is dead, the temple of Diana. So I think that was in his mind, but I also believe something else was in his mind. That's why I read from Genesis 28. 
because he talks about this house of God, and he talks about it being the pillar in the ground of the truth. And you think, well, what's in the man's mind? Well, one thing I can tell you is that he's a Jew. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, wasn't he? And so the Old Testament really was his Bible, right? I mean, and these Jewish men, most of our New Testament writers, with the exception of Luke, were Jews. And so they cut their teeth on the Old Testament. They, that, was their, that was their Bible. And so they can't write in the New Testament without the Old Testament bleeding through the pages, right? And so we always, when we want to understand the Bible, we have to be constantly looking for allusions or clear statements from the Old Testament, okay? Because that's the background. And so we want to think about Genesis 28. And I believe that there's a principle in Bible study. It's a very important principle. Uh, if you want to understand the Bible, it's called the principle of first mention. And when you are looking at any kind of word or phrase, if you see how it's used the very first time, it will invariably keep that character throughout the Word of God. Now, it may have additions. It might have, you might have an, an enhanced understanding as you go, but, but it will never change from that initial, uh, initial revelation. And so, for instance, the book of Genesis, which is the book of beginnings, by the way, I, the reason why Genesis is the object of such lethal attacks from the enemy is that if you can destroy the foundation, the whole house comes crumbling down. And the Bible is built on the foundation of the book of beginnings, right? And so uh, if the beginning is wrong, then everything's wrong, right? It's like building this structure. I hope that they put a good foundation down. I'm pretty sure they probably did, but it, it's, it's really essential. If the foundation is dodgy, then the future doesn't look good, especially, uh, you know, in this area that's known for big earthquakes and all that kind of stuff, right? I mean, the whole thing's going to go crumbling down. So we've got a good foundation. Genesis is foundational. And so a lot of truth in the Word of God has its beginning or origin in the book of Genesis. And so, for instance, at the first time, love is mentioned. Of course, we know it's Genesis 22, and it's the love of a father for his only son who he loves, right? Isn't that interesting? And that gives you an idea of what love is all about, right? And so it just carries all the way through the scriptures, doesn't it? And so we can, we can see this principle of first mention, very important. So let's look at Genesis 28, and I want to suggest to you from Genesis 28, nine principles about the house of God that are found in Genesis 28, the first time it's mentioned, that you will find consistently through the Word of God. Nine principles. Very important principles, if it, and, and so we, we want to look at them. We want to look closely at these principles and see how they carry on through the Word of God. And so the first thing we notice in this passage, just from verse 10, just to get the connection, it, it says in Genesis 28, 10, Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And that's a 60-mile trek. So as he leaves Beersheba to go to, 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 to Lutz, which is where he is right now, uh, which he, he renames Bethel, that is 60 miles. So probably a couple of days that we don't hear anything about. Right? But now this day, we hear something about what happened. And so it says, He lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night, because the sun was set, and he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. Now, that, what that tells us is that when, when Jacob left home, he didn't have a lot of time to pack. And he certainly didn't pack his pillow, you know, his favorite pillow that, you know, you sleep on. In fact, uh, he slept on rocks. And sometimes, you know, as I visit different homes, sometimes I think they've modeled their bedding on, on that, and it feels like you're sleeping on a rock, you know. But, but, but he slept, and he must have been very tired. I think the guy was emotionally exhausted, having to leave his home, leave his family, and he puts his head down on a, on a pillow that is made of rock, and he lays on a pretty firm mattress. It's called the ground. 
right? But he's jaded. He's, he's absolutely exhausted, and he sleeps. But he, when he sleeps, he has a dream, and a very interesting thing. So it says he lay down in that place, and he dreamed, verse 12, and he says, Behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. The first principle I want you to understand about the house of God, because he's going to call this place Bethel, which is the house of God. Okay, so it's it clearly the uh, house of God is in view here. And the first thing about the house of God we're going to learn as a general principle from Genesis 28 is angelic interest in the house of God. The angels ascending and descending on the house of God. On, on this stairway, this ladder, and connected with the house of God. And I think that's very interesting to me, angelic interest. I don't know if you ever think about that, but angels are really interested about the meetings of the saints. And I can prove that to you from the scriptures. They are really interested. They're not indifferent. They're, they're very interested in what goes on in a local assembly. And so let me just prove that to you uh, from various scriptures. Look at Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. And you might uh, keep a ribbon in Genesis 28. We'll be coming back. But Ephesians uh, chapter 3, and we'll see. And again, how fitting. We're in Ephesus again. Ephesians 3 and verse 10, and we'll just kind of uh, break in, uh, in verse 9, it says, to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold or the multifaceted wisdom of God. Now, just think about that now, just for a second. When we come to, to, to gather in the name of the Lord Jesus, it tells us that the angels are learning as they witness God's multifaceted wisdom by the church. And, you know, he's put Jews and Gentiles together in one body, people that once hated each other. Uh, he's, he's taken people who were rebels and now caused them to be subject to divine order. And the angels are looking in and they're, they're just aghast and they're, they're, they marvel at God's wisdom that they see in the church. And, and sometimes we don't realize that. And, and, and again, just say this, that in the New Testament... We operate by faith, not by sight. Yeah. Okay, so, so I know the angels are de divinely interested in the meetings of the local assembly, not because I've ever seen one that I'm aware of. I, I may have seen some angels unawares, but I, I'm not, I don't know, I can't think of a tangible time where I actually uh, saw an angel. So how do I know they're here? Because the Bible says so. We operate on the principle of faith. How do I know Christ is present? Where two or three gathered in my name, he says, there am I in the midst. How do I know that? Have I ever seen him? I've seen him with the eyes of faith, but I've never really seen him with my physical eyes. Right? Never touched him. Uh, I, I can't say like John, I've handled of the word of life. I, I, he did, I didn't. I just believed his testimony or the eyewitness reports. But I've never handled of the word of life in terms of the person of the Lord. But, but I know he's interested in this meeting. And I know he's present. And I know it by faith. See, when you look at the Old Testament, everything about the Old Testament worship under the law was sensuous, not sensual. I used to say sensual, and I got re reprimanded because that's usually sexual, but it's sensuous. And the idea is this, that everything appealed to the senses, right? The priestly garments, the, uh, the, 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 the glorious gold, you know, on the temple, all that kind of stuff, and the incense, and, and just everything about it appealed to the, the Levitical choirs. Everything was designed to bombard your senses. And so it was very sensual or sensuous orientated. Hard to break old habits. It's very sensuous orientated. The New Testament, totally different. 
And, and so, of course, uh, that, that has its implications. When I, when I came out of Roman Catholicism, uh, our local parish church was magnificent in terms of appealing to the senses. We had the incense. We had the priestly garments. Uh, we, we had the, the kind of tabernacle, and we, we had uh, kind of a beautiful building, magnificent. And we ended up meeting with a group of Christians in an old fisherman's hut, overhead bar heating, your head was boiling, your feet were freezing. I mean, just a dump by comparison. But the Lord was there, and the Lord wasn't in the other place, you see? And so everything there appealed to the senses. Everything in this other place appealed to faith in the Word of God. Totally different. So, so we're just thinking about angels. Not that we have to see them, uh, but we believe that because God says it, that they're learning, that actually we, through the church, are instructing angels about God's multifaceted wisdom. And then look at 1 Corinthians 11. Now, again, I'm not deliberately being controversial. I'm deliberately being biblical, okay? So 1 Corinthians 11, and again, sadly, much of Christendom ignores this completely, but it's to do with the veiling of women. And one of the things it says, and I was taught, let me say, in Bible school, I was taught that head covering was a cultural thing. And of course, I, I struggle with that, not because I had any background in it, although I remember when I was a child, I remember in the Catholic Church, ladies used to wear mantillas when I was really little. I can still vaguely remember that, but, but I have not, no axe in the game, nothing at all, right? I'm not really. But, but when I was taught it was cultural, my immediate thought was, Mike, where do you stop with that logic? Right? If that's cultural, like the New Testament was written in a completely different cultural background to I grew up in an industrial city in northern England, right? I mean, I, what, could I go through the Bible and anything that I wasn't comfortable with, could I just put it in the culture file? Say, so, oh, that's just cultural. And so I was disturbed, even though I had no answer. I didn't have an answer. It took, actually, it took me quite a, a while before I really got settled on what that teaching is about. Yeah, so it wasn't an overnight thing, but I just was disturbed in my spirit that somebody would dismiss a clear passage, 16 verses that go into a lot of things and not one mention of culture in it. And, and sometimes you read the commentaries and they talk about, well, the prostitutes in Corinth and they, you know, they used to unveil and liberty came to, to Corinth and the women, uh, you know, they threw off the veil and they, they, people were thinking they were prostitutes. And so he's telling them to cover their heads so that nobody gets the wrong idea that they're prostitutes. And I've read that passage, I don't know how many times, and I've seen no reference to prostitution. I see no, you know what it's called? You know, in the Bible, you have what we call exegesis, where you bring out of the text that which is there, right? From exit, bring out what's in the Scripture. And then you have eisegesis, where you read into the text something that isn't there. And tell, let me tell you, the idea that head covering is cultural is pure eisegesis. It's reading in that which it doesn't say. And what does it say? And this is what got me. I would just meditate on the passage. And I, again, the church we went to, nobody practiced it. So, so it, it wouldn't make any difference to me if I just chose to ignore it. But, but this is why it bothered me. Because if I ever have to preach on that passage, I thought to myself, I cannot stand there with a clear conscience and tell people that it's cultural. Because I don't see it in the passage. And I want to teach what the book says not what commentators think the book says, right? And so it says in verse 10 of 1 Corinthians 11, for this cause. Now, whenever you see that phrase, for this cause, you know what it means? This is the reason, right? That's what it means. For this cause, verse 10, ought the woman. Now, the word ought means under obligation owes a debt. I mean, it's a strong word. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. That word power, uh, some translations put a symbol of authority. Uh, a symbol of authority, because it's the idea of authority. Uh, and so she puts that on her head, and she does it because of the angels. 
Now, what does that tell you? It tells you the angels are interested. And, and I want to suggest to you why they're so interested in this is because the fall of the angels when they went after Lucifer, I think it was to do with coverings. You see, Lucifer from Ezekiel 28 was the anointed cherub that covereth. And I want to suggest to you that he was a very beautiful angel, stunningly beautiful angel, and that what he did in the presence of God was that he covered his glory, because you see that, don't you, with the cherubim and the seraphim, that they use more of their wing power to cover themselves than they do to fly with. And so the idea is that they're covering their glory in the presence of his glory. But at a certain time, Lucifer, I believe, unfurled his wings and showed his glory, dared to show his glory in the presence of God's glory. And for that reason, the fall in eternity, as it were, in, in heaven occurred. So is this, a, is this a minor issue? <laughs> because of the angels. See, what the angels see that because of the work of the gospel, sisters voluntarily cover their glory, which is their long hair, in the presence of his glory. The very opposite of what Lucifer did. And I think this is really critical. This is, this, is a sen- this is gospel truth here. This is what we're talking about. This is not some minor secondary legalistic issue. And so when the angels look in an assembly and they say, wow, this is, look what God has done. He's taken these people who were rebels and they, they now understand subjection to God's order and they're voluntarily doing this. They're, they're taking the place of subjection and they're covering their glory in the presence of of his glory, and they, they just blown away by it. And so the house of God is a place where angels are definitely interested. And even in our epistle of 1 Timothy, if you look at 1 Timothy 5, uh, when we consider even assembly discipline, 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 21, we read these interesting words. It says, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. And of course, the context context is verse 20, them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus and the elect angels. And so uh, the elect angels are even interested in assembly discipline when an assembly elder has to be rebuked. I charge you before God and the elect angels. Interesting, isn't it? They're they're interested. And I think when we get to glory, we're going to see the things that really went on in these meetings. We're going to see that when we had a prayer meeting, we weren't wrestling with flesh and blood, but we were wrestling with principalities and powers, the rulers of the darkness of this present age, right? In other words, let me just say this, the the politicians are not our enemy. They are victims of the enemy, right? That's, you know, especially the bad politicians, right? They're victims of the enemy, And so when we pray, we're entering into battle, and it's with principalities and powers in heavenly places where the battle is being won. It's not at the ballot box where the battle is won. It's at the prayer meeting where the battle is won. That might rattle a few cages, but let me say it anyway, because I really believe that's where we win the battle. We go forward on our knees. But I'm jumping ahead. That's the assembly uh, prayer. We'll get to that in a moment. But just want you to just see the the angelic interest. That's a principle about the house of God that is true and consistently true in the Scriptures. Let's go back again to Genesis 28 and think about this stairway to heaven. And so it says again in verse 12, He dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. 
And, and so <clears throat> there's this, this stairway to heaven, this ladder. It's actually a u- unique word, this word ladder that's used here. It's never used anywhere else in the Bible. It's very unique. And what is it really teaching? Well, here's man on earth, and here's God in heaven. How can man on earth bridge the gap <laughs> somehow between a holy God in heaven? There has to be some mechanism of being able to get from here to there. And it's not the Tower of Babel. See, that was man's effort to make a way to heaven, right? And they were doing it out of defiance, but they were, they were trying to build this, this, this kind of tower, this ziggurat, as they call it, that went up to heaven. And God is saying, no, there's no effort of man will ever get sinful man up to God in heaven. No matter how clever they are, they're never, go- they're never gonna do it. No, God has somehow got to provide a mechanism by which sinful man can have dealings with the Holy God. Now, let's look at the Gospel of John just for a moment. You know where I'm going. But certainly, I'm sure that Jacob meditated quite a bit about this ladder and thought a lot about it. And when we get to John's Gospel, we might see another Israelite who's also meditating about this ladder. And it tells us in verse 49, uh, well, let's just read verse 40. Let's break in verse 43. The day following Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, and saith of him, Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile, or in in whom is no Jacob. Because remember, Jacob was full of guile. He was a twister. And here's a, here's a sincere, a wonderful thing to know people that you could say he's somebody in whom is no guile. I know a few people like that. I love them. You know, they're just they're just the real deal. They're, they're, they're not out to deceive. They're not twisters in any way. They're just the real thing. And, and so Nathaniel, he's, there's no guile in him. And the Lord knew that, and he tells us that. Nathaniel said to him, Whence knowest thou me? How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. So the Lord saw him under a fig tree, and I want to suggest to you that under that fig tree, Nathaniel was meditating on the Scriptures, because that's what Jewish people did. They, they mold over the Word of God in their mind, but it's a great practice. You know, turning over the Scriptures in your mind, thinking about it, just uh, trying to understand it, grasp it. And so he says, <laughs> Nathaniel answered and said to him, um, Rabbi, thou art the, the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou, thou shalt see greater things than these. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter you shall see heaven opened, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the, not a ladder, but the Son of Man. Right? In other words, in the words of 1 Timothy, chapter 2 and verse 5, because I believe this whole thing is in the mind of Paul, Bethel, the house of God, Genesis 28. In 1 Timothy 2, 5, he makes this amazing statement. He says there's one mediator between God and man. The man, Christ Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? And so the house of God is a place where the stairway to heaven is made known to man. The truth that there's only one mediator, there's only one way to be saved, and that's why we can't have truck with all the other religions of the world, because they want to believe that everybody's, you know, every religion's fair game. And we say, no, they're not. We believe in the exclusivity of Christ as the only Savior and the only way a sinful man can ever have any dealings with a holy God in heaven. 
is through Christ in Him alone. And so the house of God stands on that, and we cannot compromise with that. And people like these World Council of Churches and all those things, they're not churches. They're, I'm sorry, but they're not. They're fakes. They're apostate. And they've apostatized on the gospel itself. Christ is the only Savior. And He's the only hope for mankind. And so the house of God is a place where the stairway to heaven is made known. And if, we, if we're failing to do that, more of that after lunch, we're going to really emphasize the house of God and its gospel after lunch. But if we're failing to do that, we have no right to call ourselves the house of God. We're just playing at games. Yeah, so <clears throat> clearly... There is a means by which a man on earth can have dealings with a holy God in heaven, but it's only through that one mediator. Uh, I've told this before, and some of you probably heard it. Some of you, unfortunately, you guys have listened to a lot of messages that I've done on tape, so I can't say anything new. You already know everything. I don't even know why you're here, because you've heard it. But, but uh, this was interesting to me, that I did a Bible study in Ireland uh, with, a, with a guy, very sincere fellow, and we were, we were taught, it was called What the Bible Teaches. And it was just going through the kind of basic doctrines. And one of the things we'd done, we taught on the deity of Christ. And the following lesson was on the humanity of Christ. And so as one of the key scriptures on the full humanity of the Lord Jesus, we said there's one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. And immediately that man said to me, where does that leave Mary? Now, what was interesting is I, I never mentioned anything about the idea of one media. All I'm talking about is uh, the man Christ Jesus. That's my point, but it's not what the Holy Spirit wanted him to get. The Holy Spirit wanted him to get the fact that if there's only one mediator, where does that leave Mary? Because in Catholicism, if you want to deal with God, you speak to his mother. See, that's how it works. And I said, well, where do you think? It leaves Mary. Much better I get them to say it than you tell them. So he was really uncomfortable. I mean, he's squirming because he didn't want to say it leaves her in left field. There's nowhere for her. And he didn't want to say it. So I said to him, look, either the Bible's true or Catholicism is true, but they both can't be true at this point. And he said, well, the Bible's true. So I said, where does it leave Mary? Nowhere. She needed a savior. And she magnified the Lord, her Savior. She recognized that. So again, we just want to recognize that, that there's only one mediator. And every other proponent to be a mediator is an imposter. Because there's only one. And that's the Lord. And the house of God is strong on this. It believes this. It, it reiterates this truth. And then the house of God is a place where the promises of God are reiterated and explained. Look at verse 13. Behold, the Lord stood above it and said, uh, I, now this is above the ladder. So this is Jehovah above the ladder. He's, he's there in heaven. He stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, the God of Isaac. And of course, the Lord Jesus would use this very thing and say to the Sadducees, that Jesus said that I am the God of, not I was the God of Abraham, I, was, I am the God of, there was, he's not the God of the dead, but of the living. Even though Abraham, Isaac were already dead, he's affirming the fact that they're actually really alive, probably more alive than they were when they were on the earth. But he says that God says, um, Concerning the promises, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, God of Isaac. The land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, to the north, and to the south. And in thee, and in thy seed, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And so here we are, families of the earth not Jewish, although I just learned that the English are actually Semites. That blew me away on the Answers in Genesis. 
I always thought we were Jabeth, but we're not. We're actually Semites. I'm, I'm not believing British Israelism, just in case you're thinking that. It's not, uh, it's through a different descent, but it's through Shem, which is kind of interesting. I don't know how I got there. But anyway, the, the point is simply this, that all the families of the earth will be blessed in a descendant of Jacob. And we know who that descendant is. Um, through thy seed singular, not seed, seed singular, all the families of the earth will be blessed through the Lord Jesus, the Messiah. And here we are. We're, uh, you, you feel blessed today? <laughs> I feel very blessed. And again, uh, the house of God is a place where God's promises are reiterated and explained. Okay? And so it's a place where we tell people what the promises of God are. The promises of God concerning Israel. There are promises of God still concerning the nation of Israel that are yet to be fulfilled in space-time history. He's not done with his ancient people. He still will fulfill all the promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob concerning the land, concerning a king. All of these things are going to come true. And, and so at the house of God, we, we need to explain the promises of God, not just to Israel, but to the church, to us. What wonderful promises we have got. Uh, isn't it good to have a promise the absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Is that a good promise? Uh, to be with Christ, which is far better. Is that a good promise? I think it's a great promise. And so there are a lot of promises that need to be uh, kind of emphasized frequently to the people of God in the house of God. It's where you learn those promises, where they're taught. Also, it's a place where the presence of God is. Notice verse 16. Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And we said that, that, you know, we have a promise. Where two or three are gathered, there am I in the midst. Now, we might not be conscious of it. He's clearly not conscious of it. He said, I knew it not. The Lord was in this place, and I knew it not. He wasn't aware of it. And sometimes, just simply by faith, we say the Lord is here. But there are times, special times, where it's evident the Lord is here. And you don't have to say it. I love those times. I love those times where it's so evident the Spirit of God is working and God's presence is real in the assembly that you couldn't deny it. You'd say, I know the Lord was here this morning. It was wonderful. And we don't have to just say, well, two or three are gathered there. He is in the midst. It would be redundant to say it. You know it. But sometimes we go by faith. But it's a place where the presence of God is. And you see that throughout the Word of God. Like when the tabernacle was, uh, was first erected, what happened? The glory filled the tabernacle. The priest couldn't even enter in because of the glory, right? The presence of God was there. And they knew the presence of God was there. When the temple uh, under Solomon was dedicated, again, what happened? Uh, the, the presence of God filled the place. And then when the New Testament house of God began in Acts chapter 2, it says the presence of God was evident, right? It, the, the place where they were was filled with the sound of a rushing, mighty wind. And it was evident the Lord was there. His presence was real. And so we, we believe that the house of God is a place of the presence of God. And then, fifthly, again, verse 17, he says, he was afraid and said, how dreadful is this place. This is none other but the house of God. How dreadful is this place. The house of God is a place of reverence and fear. Right? Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? We, I mean, we recognize we can come boldly to the throne of grace. We don't want to take that away. It's a wonderful thing. But we're not casual about this, right? We're coming into the presence of a thrice holy God. And so, so there's a sense of reverence. And of course, uh, reverence be becometh thy house, O God. The scripture says that, right? It's fitting for the house of God that reverence be truly shown in the house of God. And so it is a place of reverence and a, a place of fear. And, and you say, uh, this idea of the fear of God, it's not just an Old Testament idea, but it's a New Testament idea too. Uh, look again at Acts chapter 9, 
Uh, we, we can see from Scripture that the fear of God was connected with the house of God, even in the New Testament church. It says in Acts 9.31, Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord, and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, were multiplied. Right? They were walking in the fear of God and the comfort of the Holy Ghost. So, so there's a definite fear of God and a reverence for God. And, and it, it, it needs to be. Um, I often tell people when, when we were naturalized as U.S. citizens, my wife and I, um, we did it on two different occasions, uh, not through our desire, but through theirs. Uh, they, they arranged it that we actually naturalized different days and different locations. And so my wife was in Atlanta, and I was able to go with her, and they, they were getting ready. The guy was coming up to the podium to begin the ceremony, and there was a guy sat in the audience with a hat on. And the man said, we will not begin this ceremony, sir, until you remove your hat. I am here representing the President of the United States, and we will not begin unless you remove your hat. Now this guy, let me just tell you, that he's gone through a lot to get this possibility of becoming a U.S. citizen. He's not going to throw it away at this stage. So immediately, he removed his hat. And then the guy said, now we can begin. Now, isn't that interesting? That, that for this man was just a representative of the president of the United States. He's not, he's not the president. The president wasn't there, just a representative. But because he represented the president, he said there needs to be proper respect. And so what about the house of God? We're ambassadors for Christ, aren't we? <laughs> we represent a much higher authority, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so there needs to be a reverence for the house of God. <clears throat> he says it's the house of God, it's the gate of heaven. We've already talked about that uh, a little bit, but it's interesting that the, the idea of the gate of heaven is a, a fascinating thing to me. Again, in verse 17, this is none other but the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. The gate is where affairs are administered in Scripture. So when there's a need to, uh, uh, for, uh, you know, when, when Ruth was uh, uh, going to be uh, the kinsman redeemer, uh, so where was that business transacted? Well, it was in the gate, Right? Uh, when Solomon stole the hearts of the people from David, what did he do? Well, he hung out at the gate because that's where justice was administered. Uh, by the way, uh, when Sodom was in the gate of, uh, sorry, uh, Lot was in the gate of Sodom, he was no mere spectator. He was actually on the city council. That's what that means. One of the judges, he was entrenched in Sodom. And so it's the idea of where administration, where justice takes place. And I want to suggest to you the house of God is the place where God's affairs are dealt with and administered. Right? Not the Vatican. It's the house of God. That's where God's affairs are dealt with. And so things like discipline for the house of God, where does it take place? In the house of God, right? We receive somebody in a fellowship and... Uh, last resort after trying lots of other things if they don't repent we remove them from fellowship we put them out of fellowship and that is administered at the house of God God's affairs and he said whatever you you bind on earth is bound in heaven I'm, I'm supporting you in your actions and so it clearly is a place where heaven's affairs are administered now we've only done six of the nine principles but this clock is telling me and the smells coming up from downstairs are telling me a different message. And I'm concerned that you'll be able to concentrate as these smells increase. You may have a wandering mind. And we don't want to, this, these principles are very important. We want to make sure we get them. So we're going to just pause and give thanks for the word of God. You want me to give thanks for the food or you want to wait till we go downstairs? Yes, I'm getting a nod. Okay, Father, we're, we're thankful for spiritual food because your word is so full and so fascinating and so amazing and so consistent. Lord, we think of these first mentions and how these principles just continue throughout the Word of God. Oh, Father, we're just glad to have a book like this and so glad to have a God like this, the living God, not some dead, inanimate object, but a God who's alive 
and working. Even today, we believe you're working and working in our midst and speaking. And we pray you would speak very clearly. And we pray that we would have hearts of submission and subjection to your word. And we'd also, Lord, have hearts of reverence towards you, realizing you're infinitely holy and, and we're just mere men. And so we pray that we might have that right respect for you and for your house. Father, we, we do pray uh, again for uh, the food. We thank you for those that have prepared it for us, Lord. We're so grateful for the uh, often sisters working behind the scenes quietly for our benefit, for our nourishment. Bless them, Lord, in their work and bless the food to our use and bless our fellowship, Lord. We pray that we won't descend into trivia, but we would be able to talk to one another and exhort and encourage one another daily while it's yet today. And we'll give thee the glory in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.